this viral photo here was taken in 2019. Um, in the beginning of the anti-extradition movement, the commercial was shown at one of the main protest fields in Hong Kong. And every time I see this picture, I will regret a question in my mind. What does your revolution look like? My grandparents were indigenous fishermen in Hong Kong, living in a small village um, in a satellite island. And they, they used to live on a boat as well. It was a quiet, clean, and pure village where people were free and happy until it became overdeveloped, overexploited, and overcrowded. It also seems as a reflection of Hong Kong, because I, I recall when I was young, Hong Kong has every good thing with it. And yes, I grew up in a generation witnessing every step of the kind in Hong Kong after the handover of Hong Kong to the Chinese Communist Party in 97. Fast forward to 2014, the, Uni uh, the, the Umbrella Movement took place, 79 days of occupation in the heart of Hong Kong. And it was the first time I taste what a tear gas was. During the last few days of the Umbrella Movement, this We Will Be Back banners were hung all over the major occupied streets across Hong Kong. And after five years, we were back, stronger and more united in resisting the authoritarian regime. And since July, uh, the 12th of June in uh, 2019, there were protests in every corner of Hong Kong, in the CBDs, in the tourist streets, major tunnels, the airports, the universities, and also the Legislative Council, one of the most symbolizing the public power, the power of people. I was a legislative assistant by then, working for a pro-democratic legislator, who is now a political prisoner. We joined every protest in the front line, days and nights, without wearing any mask or protective gear, just trying to negotiate with the police force, to exercise the legislators' rights to protect the protesters from police brutality, which unfortunately didn't work out. The police lost its sanity. I remember it was a protest in the midsummer. It was sunny and hot, and it was a Sunday. A rifle pointed at my head. It was so close that I could see the bullet head from the gun barrel. I was frozen, I was so scared. And then I was pulled away by an anonymous protester who I never met again. And the next moment I remember there was gunshot all around. Sound like fireworks, but they are all gunshots. And then suddenly my right arm was shot by a rubber bullet. And fortunately, luckily, it was only a rubber bullet. It was the moment I decided to step up to run for an election. All this year, our generation witnesses how the regime destroyed the once very bright future of our beloved hometown, and how the police escalated its violence and turned Hong Kong to a police state. It left me no choice but persist to resist. In November 2019, the election day held amidst of two major university sages. It was indeed a bittersweet moment for me because on one hand, I witnessed my alma mater was being ruled by the police. Many of my friends and colleagues from the college were wounded and arrested. But the next day I was elected as well as the rest of 300 and 87 pro-democratic candidates. It was a mixed emotion because we witnessed the best of time that 
Hong Kong has demonstrated its eagerness for freedom and democracy, but it's also the worst of time showing that how Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers are being oppressed by the dictator. Long after, the police and the Hong Kong government, of course, tightened its rule over Hong Kong. They did not only prosecute thousands of protesters in Hong Kong, but also they enforced a national security law to Hong Kong just one year after the protests. And since 2019, we, we are now having 1,840 political prisoners who are now in jail, either serving a harsh sentences or detention. And Hong Kong is actually only a 7 million population city. My closest friends and fellows were arrested one by one during that time. And it was, those months were like the toughest of, for us, for many of us. We were all of a sudden woke up in the morning at 5 or 6 a.m. worrying that my door would be knocked by the police or another friend of mine would be arrested. Not, not to mention the surveillance by the National Security Police and the har harassment by the state media that I experienced. I was forced to resign from my office before I made a tough decision to flee Hong Kong. I boarded a flight to London six days, just six days after I purchased a round trip ticket. Like many of these sensitive personnel, the alarm rang when I was trying to get through the immigration. Perhaps it's because it's a round trip ticket it's in, instead of a one-way ticket, or I wasn't at the top of the list by that time. I was uneasily arrived in London. By that time, it was also the exodus of Hong Kongers since 2020, at least 400,000 of Hong Kongers fled and relocated to other countries. However, the repression did not stop at the national boundaries. I was wanted by the Hong Kong government just because I called Hong Kongers to cast blank votes in the legislative council elections. The authority stretches its long arms and try to silence diaspora on abroad. After all, more activists are wanted, and some are even having one million Hong Kong dollar bounties on their head right now. Only two weeks ago, the Hong Kong government enacted another national security law. It is by a version of the previous one, life imprisonment, recognition of socialism, prolonged detention, and also extraterritorial implication, which first appear in the common law system of Hong Kong. Anyone falls out for freedom and democracy, anyone criticizes the government, will be seen as treason. Anyone who are abroad could be seen as absconders or external forces. Such transnational repression has posed a chilling effect among the Hong Kong diaspora, alienating the core advocates from general community and isolating Hong Kongers inside Hong Kong from the rest of the world. Disappointedly, host countries of the Hong Kong diaspora has done very little to tackle these kind of alarming issues. And indeed, it is very despairing for all of us as if only silence echo spread. In an era which Taiwanese appeal is going, like-minded allies should stand in solidarity with us, with those who are struggling to confront with the totalitarian, with the authoritarian, with the dictators. Instead of appalling for them, the CCP has been using economic interests and fundings to try to push for democratic uh, diplomacy influences, particularly in Global South, here, pressuring countries to lean towards it and reshape the human rights narrative in the international community. 
So that's why it is really essential for partners supporting freedom and democracy, and especially those in Global South, to stand in solidarity with us and to stand up against the CCP aggression. I always imagined a free and democratic Hong Kong where I could be able to reunite it with my families in the Rose House or perhaps run a small cafe in the countryside in frightening to all my friends who will be free from jail some days to come over and meet again and to experience a life that I've never been able to experience. I certainly believe that this imagination would come true someday because even though we are now in exile, even though we could not, we lost tie with Hong Kongers inside Hong Kong. I know many of the, them are still trying and resisting. If those who are in jail now haven't given up on Hong Kong yet, I, we do not have any grounds to give up on Hong Kong. And therefore, I'm determined to dedicate my life just to prove the existence of Hong Kong, just to advocate for the beliefs and values that we cherished, whatever it takes. And this is my kind of revolution. And this is the revolution of our times. Thank you.